welcome everyone who's here. Please have a seat. Make yourself at home. Make yourself comfortable. Uh, the Senate Environment and Public Works Committee is honored to convene today in Wyoming for a field hearing at the Wyoming Integrated Test Center. And I really want to thank Senator Enzi, a Wyoming senior senator. He is the chairman of the Senate Budget Committee. Uh, but most importantly, he is a former mayor of Gillette, Wyoming. And I want to thank him for joining us here today. Now, Mike, we're normally Wednesday doing Wyoming Wednesdays in Washington with donuts and coffee and juice and everyone from Wyoming. And I guess I wanted to get donuts, but they said due to coronavirus, I just couldn't have boxes of donuts here today. So we can't quite do Wyoming Wednesday, but uh, it's a pretty good group. It is. I'm looking at all the folks that are here, here today. Well, today we're here to discuss Wyoming's leadership in using and in storing carbon dioxide emissions. Just outside these doors is a world-class facility where uh, research is currently underway to study how we can create commercial value from carbon dioxide that would otherwise just go up into the atmosphere. Located next to Basin Electric Drive for Power Station, and we were both here for the grand opening a dozen years ago, the Integrated Test Center hosts research that will create new markets and new jobs in Wyoming. The center will research how to transform coal power plant emissions into building materials like cement, as well as alternative fuels. Uh, through a relationship with NRG Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, or COSIA, XPRIZE, the center will welcome five teams of researchers from around the world. Uh, last year, I met with one of the finalist teams from Aberdeen, Scotland, during a trip to their research lab, we had five senators that were on that trip, a bipartisan group, uh, including uh, Lisa Murkowski, the president and chairman of the Energy Committee, uh, Maria Cantwell, who has served uh, as ranking member of that committee previously, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse from Rhode Island, and Joe Manchin from West Virginia. It's, it's not surprising that Wyoming can attract such top talent from around the world, because in Wyoming, we're blessed with tremendous fuel resources, coal, natural gas, oil, and most of that coal comes from right here, Mike, in uh, your home community of Campbell County. The world-class researchers at this center will study how to transform the carbon dioxide from burning these abundant fuel resources into a host of new and innovative applications. These new applications can be added to currently viable commercial uses for carbon dioxide. A process that many of us know is uh, enhanced oil recovery. It's already being used in Wyoming, and with Randall Luthi here, it was being used when he was Speaker of the House of the Wyoming Legislature. Uh, this is where carbon dioxide is injected to produce oil from older, more mature, into older, uh, more mature uh, fields. And once this process is complete, the carbon dioxide is then permanently stored underground. Uh, if we can harness carbon dioxide from power plants and other facilities, Wyoming has the great potential for even broader scale enhanced oil recovery. Wyoming has abundant deep saline formations. These formations can store carbon dioxide deep underground instead of being released into the atmosphere. Scientists from the University of Wyoming, many are here today, are conducting geologic testing in a formation just a short distance from this center. As chairman of the Environment and Public Works Committee in the United States Senate, carbon capture is one of my top policy priorities. Two years ago, President Trump signed an extension and expansion of the 45Q tax credit for carbon capture facilities. Now we must make sure that that credit can be deployed and used to build new carbon capture projects. In order to accomplish this goal, I have pushed the Internal Revenue Service and specifically and directly the Secretary of the Treasury to issue the much needed guidance this year. I've also introduced legislation called the Use It Act, and that stands for Utilizing Significant Emissions and Innovative Technologies Act, use it, Act to complement the 45Q tax credit. This bill ensures that Washington is a willing partner in the development of carbon capture projects. The Use It Act helps researchers find commercial uses for captured carbon dioxide emissions. It supports the use of carbon capture technology, including direct air capture. The Use It Act also directs the federal government work with developers to expedite, not block, the permitting process. We know all too well that delayed permitting can kill important projects. 
The Use It Act also funds research, such as the type of research occurring right here at the Integrated Test Center for carbon utilization as well as direct air capture. The Use It Act passed the Senate for a second time this summer after passing the committee I chair unanimously 21 to nothing. Last year, House Democrats blocked it from becoming law. That was in the House, but we have unanimous agreement in the Senate, and I'm working to secure its passage into law this year. Wyoming continues to be the leading state in the nation with regard to carbon capture research. So I'm so pleased that today's hearing can be held to shine a spotlight on the great work that is happening right here in our state. And I'd like to right now turn this over to Senator Enzi for any opening remarks that he would like to make. Thank you, John, and uh, thank you for holding this hearing here. Uh, I think this is very unusual testing center uh, that will make a difference for the country. And I, I thank you for your role in uh, being the chairman of the Environment Public Works Committee. That's infrastructure as well as in environment. And uh, I know that you're in line to be the chairman of the Energy Committee as well. Uh, that will definitely be a help entire process. Uh, besides that, of course, John is one of the leaders in the Senate. Uh, he's the one of the top. He's in the, in the five people that can make morning decisions for what we're going to do and how we're going to do it. And he does an outstanding job with that as well as um, presenting the case uh, to the nation. So I'm thankful for you doing this hearing. I know it will make a difference. Um, I want to also welcome County commissioners here today and others, and uh, I, I used to be the mayor here, and, and the, you'll see the symbol for the city is the energy capital of the nation, and that's because in this county we have more BTUs of energy than Saudi Arabia has, and uh, we can utilize it or we can pass it over, and a lot of jobs rely on that, and the jobs are well-paying jobs, thousands.
nothing that the federal government does is worth much unless there's talented and capable people on the ground with policies and action. And I'm looking forward to our discussion and, and learning more about how we can work together to continue advancing these technologies and the ones that have come out of it. I'm on the uh, Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, and one of the stunning things that I ran into there is that the average kid that's in junior high right now will have over 15 different occupations based on how technology is moving ahead. And what really stunned me was 11 of those haven't even been invented yet. So the world's going to change. We need to make sure we're educating our kids so that they take advantage of that change and make the change. And this is one of the places where that change can be made. And so, John, I really appreciate you holding your hearing here and bringing to light some of these opportunities that we have. And that's how we have to look at any problem as an opportunity. So thank you, John. Well, well thank you, Mike. And you, know, you look around the room and talk about your time here as, as mayor and my time in the legislature, your time in the legislature, and now in the Senate. And I'm going to introduce our friend <coughs> Randall Luthi in a few moments as the chief energy advisor to Wyoming Governor Gordon. Uh, but, you know, you look at his Jim Anderson. He was probably here in Gillette when you were mayor. But now he got, and you will got reelected more last night. You won your primary to the state senate in Natrona County. So yeah. congratulations. I know it's a late night. Although the results on your race are pretty early. Uh, congratulations. <laughs> and, you know, it's fun to have Rita Meyer here, former uh, auditor. We have talking about leadership at the local level. We have Rusty Bell here from the county commissioner and, and uh, as a graduate of leadership Wyoming and all the activity there. And it's, and it's nice to have Ed Seidel here, the <coughs> president of the University of Wyoming. So we are represented all across uh, the board with people committed to, uh, to Wyoming and to the nation and to energy and the needs that, that we have and that we have the availability uh, right here in Wyoming. But with that, I'd like to introduce, uh, and it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Randall Luthi, who is the Chief Energy Advisor to Wyoming Governor Mark Borden. He's an attorney, a rancher, former Speaker of the Wyoming House of Representatives, who's brought considerable insight and experience to the Governor's Office, and we're grateful for that. Uh, prior to joining the Governor's Office, he's President of the National Offshore Ocean Industries Association, so he knows lots about energy uh, onshore and offshore. He served in the Department of Interior as the Director of Minerals Management Service and as Deputy Director of the Department's Fish and Wildlife Service. I had the pleasure of serving with him in the Wyoming Legislature for many years. Uh, proud to continue to work with him on behalf of the people of Wyoming. And you testified last year at the Senate Environment Public Works Committee. But welcome here today, uh, Mayor. Well, thank you very much. And thanks for those kind words. Uh, Chairman Barrasso, Senator Enzi, on behalf of Governor Gordon, welcome. Senator Enzi, this is like double home for you. you know, not only the state, as, we've, as everybody has pointed out, but the Gillette as well. You know, the work you both do in D.C. is so vital to the people of Wyoming. But it's your dedication to return regularly to the state, to find out what is relevant, is what keeps you well grounded. And the governor appreciates that. The people of Wyoming appreciate that. Thank you for your efforts, particularly in this last, this calendar year as we have faced the oil war oil war wars unwarranted market pressures on coal and a pandemic you know we no longer muse in the governor's office about what else could go wrong for fear that it actually is and on a more personal note you know I did have truly the pleasure and the honor to serve with both of you in the legislature uh, I recall you represented your districts with honor and distinction, and you've continued to clear that high bar in the U.S. Senate. Mike, Senator Anzi, today has to be a little bit bittersweet for you, because think about it, how long has it been since you haven't had your name on a ballot in the primary election? However, I'll bet you and Diana are already well into making plans for doing something else with your next career. But again, thank you for a long, and I describe it as just put your head down and work, career of public service. All right, back to the business at hand. You have chosen wisely to hold a field hearing at the Integrated Test Center. Uh, this center represents innovation, cooperation, and hope for our future. The 
the center wouldn't be here except for the cooperation and the generosity of the electric utilities, the state of Wyoming, the community of Gillette, Campbell County, U.S. US Department of Energy, and in particularly those willing to push the envelope, such as XPRIZE participants. You know, at a time when so many loud voices, and I think it's the loud voices of the few, that are calling to remove fossil fuels from our energy portfolio, this center provides an opportunity to focus on the real issue. How do we prevent or remove CO2 from the atmosphere? What are the other uses of coal and CO2 that could benefit our economy and consumers? This center proves to be essential to our future livelihoods and economy. Its work is exciting and it has the full support of the government. And although I am not a witness today, uh, the governor certainly supports measures such as the use of that. Wyoming has enacted key legislation to promote the use of CO2 capture. And as you all know, the ability to use those 45 Q credits is what's going to make that work. Our legislature is also looking forward. Their almost two year process to establish the Wyoming Energy Authority is complete or nearly complete. The governor is committed to working with the WEA and support all forms of energy. The ITC is essential in the governor's energy and economic strategy. We are committed to ensuring that the strengths of the Wyoming Infrastructure Authority and the Wyoming Pipeline Authority remain and are available to assist the stakeholders to those who have generously invested in this one-of-a-kind center. We do know there are challenges today, and there will likely be far more tomorrow. Political winds change directions like a pinball at an arcade. But we must all commit to a steady, sure-footed energy policy that provides stability, reliability, and availability of all energy resources. So thank you again, and thank you for giving the governor's office a chance to welcome you because there's, you are always welcome. The governor looks forward to seeing both of you in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks, Randall. We really appreciate you being here and uh, all of your help and direction. Absolutely. Thank you. We're now going to turn to our panel of witnesses, and I would invite the three of them to come up. And Randall mentioned the X Prize, and we're very fortunate to have with us the executive director, uh, Dr. Marcus uh, Exmoor, who is here overseeing the executive director related to the Carbon X Prize. So we're grateful to have you. We also have uh, Dr. Holly Kripka, who is the executive director of the School of Energy Resources at the University of Wyoming, as well as Jason Becker, who is the deputy director of the Wyoming Energy Authority and the managing director uh, right here at the Wyoming Integrated uh, Test Center. Uh, we're we're going to start with, with Jason, and Jason is the current deputy director, as I said, here uh, to the Wyoming Energy Authority, manages the Integrated Test Center, uh, grew up in eastern Montana, worked in Washington for a couple of members of Congress. Uh, after his time there, he worked for the Petroleum Association of Wyoming for Rio Tinto, uh, and that became Cloud Peak. Uh, graduated with a bachelor's degree from Montana State University, master's in business administration from the University of Denver. Uh, you were back in Washington to testify to the uh, Environment and Public Works Committee. We're grateful for that. He, he and his family live outside of Cheyenne. It's a pleasure to have you join us today. Please proceed. Now, I, we're going to ask all of you to apply, try to keep your remarks about five minutes so we have time for questions. Uh, thank you, Chairman Barrasso, uh, Senator Enzi. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today. Um, as, uh, as the Chairman said, my name is Jason Baggert. I'm the Managing Director of the Integrated Test Center. And a little, th little over three years ago, I had the opportunity to testify before this committee in your hearing room in Washington, so it's a great honor to have you um, out at our facility today. Um, the ITC is a private-public partnership between the state of Wyoming, based in the Electric Power Cooperative, Tri-State <coughs> Transmission and Generation Association, and the National Rural Electric Cooperative Association, also known as NRECA. We have also had various in-kind contributions from Black Hills Energy and Rocky Mountain Power. The value of the private sector stakeholders is immeasurable as they have incredible experience with project management, technology review, and strong federal relationships. This facility was authorized in 2014 by the Wyoming legislature, and what you see today has all occurred within the past six years. 
through our coalition, we have constructed a facility, developed a communications plan, established <coughs> business development strategies, as well as all the necessary operational plans. Through relationships with the Department of Energy's National Carbon Capture Center and the International Carbon Capture Test Center Network, we've been able to learn and share best practices. At the end of the construction, the facility came in 18% under budget, which provides additional funding for operations. The ITC fills a very unique need within the United States. While developers have tested larger projects in the U.S., this is the only dedicated testing site. Sorry. This is the only dedicated testing site that can host larger pilot and demonstration projects. Currently, many DOE-funded projects must travel to Norway to scale up. The ITC provides an opportunity to spend those U.S. dollars here at a substantially reduced cost, providing better value to our taxpayers. We have worked hard to forge a strong relationship with DOE, and last summer hosted Assistant Secretary for Fossil Energy, Steve Winberg. Uh, Senator Enzi at that time was able to join us for the, that tour out here. We recognize that while we have a great facility, we need DOE support to fund the projects we ultimately want to test and host here. One important lesson we've learned is scaling up technology takes a long time. It takes years to move through the funding opportunities, the design, the fabrication, and finally testing. In order to see the real fruits, we need long-term commitments from the federal government to support testing. Our testing partners need to know that they'll have the resources they need to methodically scale up and provide the types of technical assurances utilities need to feel comfortable commercializing the technologies. The Use It Act would greatly assist in this area. Many, but not all of our potential tenants are seeking federal funding, and whether or not they receive funding will determine if they can deploy on site. Currently, we have relationships with XPRIZE, which you'll hear about from Dr. X for, the Japan Coal Energy Center, also known as J-Coal, <coughs> Kawasaki Heavy Industries, Columbia University, TDA Research, Membrane Technology and Research, Gas Technology Incorporated, Air Liquide, and the University of Kentucky. With regards to the research community, we view them as partners, not just tenants. One of the great benefits of the ITC is the blank canvas approach we can provide. We have ample physical space to host an array of technologies and add amenities as we grow. We hope we can partner with our tenants to repurpose equipment that, may no, that they may no longer need to provide expanded testing capabilities. A great example of this project is one that would grant their steam boiler to the ITC upon the completion of their test. Steam is an integral component of many carbon capture technologies that would be a valuable service to provide. Lastly, I'd like to touch upon how Wyoming views the ITC as a linchpin for broader economic technology and development. We have worked closely with Campbell County, the School of Energy Resources, the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute, the Wyoming Business Council, and many others. We make sure prospective tenants are aware of the expertise and resources within each of these organizations and how they may be able to best assist to make Wyoming, the Wyoming experience as seamless as possible. A win-win for Wyoming is first developing these technologies that can be employed to preserve the economic value of the fossil energy industry and then capturing the, managing, the manufacturing and technology development that's perfected at the ITC. I appreciate the opportunity to speak with you today and we're glad to answer your questions. Well, thanks so much, Jason. We'll get back to you with the questions in, in a few minutes. But I'd like to turn to uh, Dr. Holly Krutka, who is the Executive Director of the School of Energy Resources at the University of Wyoming. Immediately before joining the university, she served as Vice President for Coal Generation and Emissions Technologies at Peabody, the world's largest private sector coal producer. Uh, and she's held a variety of roles in the energy industry and has worked specifically on carbon capture during her career. Uh, but she's an innovator herself and actually holds three patents. The, uh, holds a bachelor's degree and a PhD from the University of Oklahoma in chemical energy native of Oklahoma, and we're so pleased that she and her family have chosen to make Laramie their home. Please proceed. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, Senator Enzi, I appreciate the chance to speak with you today about the opportunities that support
for energy innovation right here in Wyoming. My name is Dr. Holly Krecka. I am the Executive Director of the University of Wyoming School of Energy Resources, or SER. SER is focused on energy-driven economic development for the state of Wyoming, which means that we're focused on technology that will help support the needs of Wyoming and its energy customers. If there's one thing you take from my testimony, let it be that Wyoming is an ideal place to drive innovation and deployment of climate-focused technologies such as carbon capture, use, and storage, because the state bo boasts vast fundamental subsurface knowledge, world-class research programs, the ability to execute large demonstration projects, and the will to drive technology development with the necessary, necessary policy support that can ultimately result in commercialization. The University of Wyoming boasts a world-class research program in the Center of Innovation for Flow Through Forest Media, led by Professor <coughs> Muhammad Perry. The center is located at the University of Wyoming's High Bay Research Facility, which contains more than 90,000 square feet that make up, to the best of my knowledge, the world's largest experimental research facility focused on flow through forest media and problems associated with applications in hydrocarbon recovery, geologic sequestration of greenhouse gases, and more. It's been developed using more than $100 million of investment from the state of Wyoming and corporate sponsors. The center provides imaging and flow capabilities at the atomic, nano, micro, and macro scales. In the drive toward commercializing novel technologies, a commercial entity has been spun off and is offering services today. SCR and our project partners are reimagining the use of coal as we develop thermo, a thermochemical process that uses non, or produces non-fuel and energy products from Wyoming coal to create products like soil amendments, building materials, asphalt replacement, electro-spun carbon fiber mats that could be used for energy storage, and much more. In addition, SCR is developing a dry methane reforming catalyst that uses carbon dioxide and natural gas to generate syngas, which is carbon monoxide and hydrogen. Our current estimates are that this dry methane reforming process <coughs> could create hydrogen at half the cost of current steam methane reforming technologies. This use for CO2 is an important component of the thermochemical process because it allows all the products I mentioned to be created um, from Wyoming coal and with most of the carbon locked up in the products and near zero carbon footprint. SER Center for Economic Geology Research, or CEGR, is a group of applied geoscientists dedicated to developing opportunities to diversify Wyoming's economy and maintain competitiveness in a low carbon energy future. It includes rec internationally recognized experts on the topic of CO2 geologic storage. Funded by the Department of Energy through the Carbon Storage Assur uh, Assurance Enterprise or Carbon Safe Program, this CEGR is investigating the commercial feasibility of geologic CO2 storage of 2 million tons per year and a total of at least 50 million tons of CO2 located right here at Dry Forest Power Plant. This project, referred to as Wyoming Carbon Safe, possesses favorable technical, economic, and policy attributes to advance the eventual commercialization of large-scale carbon capture and storage at a modern coal-fired power plant. Another tool in Wyoming's CCUS tool belt is the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute, or EORI. EORI's mission is to facilitate a meaningful and measurable increase in recoverable reserves and production of oil and natural gas in Wyoming. While necessary to help drive state GDP, CO2 Enhanced Oil Recovery, or EOR, is also a commercial scale climate change mitigation technology. Historical storage of CO2 with EOR typically sequestered 0.2 metric tons of CO2 per barrel of oil produced. Today, with the current and next generation technology <coughs> being tested and applied in Wyoming, up to 0.5 metric tons of CO2 can be stored per barrel of oil produced with the possibility of storing even more CO2 per barrel with further research. These technologies could provide a threefold increase in the amount of CO2 stored while producing the same amount of domestic oil. The final ingredient needed to commercialize CCUS and other environmentally focused technologies is the right policy framework. Wyoming has applied for and should be the second state to receive Class 6 well primacy, allowing the state to implement CCUS projects that are in its interest on a timeline that works for commercial developers. In addition, SCR's recently launched Center for Energy Regu Regulation and Policy Analysis or CERPA, CERPA, is embarking on a variety of interdisciplinary energy policy studies to focus on the state of Wyoming's economy. CERPA is poised to begin an assessment of Wyoming House Bill 200, which established a nation-leading CCUS standard for elect electricity generation. Among other CCUS-related activities, CERPA is also preparing model CCUS agreements for, under the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project. So in 
summary, while we face many challenges in the global energy sector and with widespread deployment of CCUS, Wyoming stands ready to help and has the necessary tools to make CCUS and other energy technologies a commercial reality. Thank you. Well, thank you for your thoughtful testimony. We'll get to questions in, in a moment, but I'm now delighted to welcome Dr. Marcus Exdor here, who is a PhD, uh, as well as a Master of Science in Physics from the University of Toronto where he explored the quantum mechanics of light and matter near absolute zero. Uh, he also holds a Bachelor of Science in Engineering Science from the University of Toronto, uh, where he built a, a pancake-making robot. Uh, pretty good. Combine nanotechnology, nanomaterials, solar cells. You need to meet the president of the University of Wyoming who has a relativistic astrophysics PhD on the collision of black holes. So. Between the two of you, I, you know. <laughs> Jim Anderson, be careful. You're going to be in the two of them. So. You're looking at the wrong guy. <laughs> we are delighted that you're here with us today and are in charge of the X Prize. And please proceed with your testimony. Thanks very much, uh, Mr. Chairman and Senator Enzi. Uh, and to the broader committee, it's a thrill to be here um, and a pleasure to have the opportunity to speak to you about transforming what we usually think of as a liability, carbon dioxide, into an asset. Um, my name is Marcus Exdor. I am the executive director of the NRG COSIA Carbon X Prize, which is a $20 million global incentive prize competition to drive breakthrough innovation in exactly that, turning CO2 to something more useful. Um, a really interesting part of that role is it's allowed me to really get a front row seat to not just energy innovation, but carbon management innovation in particular. Um, if there's one thing to take away from my remarks today, it's that uh, carbon tech, which is the of jargon I'm going to use to describe the basket of technologies that we can use to turn CO2 into other materials and the materials themselves. So that carbon tech is a new technology space, it's an emerging space, so it's quite young, but can be a really promising tool to decarbonize our existing energy sector, to help us fight climate change, and to support long-term and sustainable economic growth. As has been mentioned before, I'm going to echo some of the testimony of my colleagues here, uh, the state of Wyoming really is extremely well positioned, not just because of the ITC, to lead in this area and already is actually demonstrating a leadership here. Now, carbon dioxide is usually thought of, if we think of it at all, as a colorless, odorless, invisible gas, maybe a greenhouse gas, but we don't usually think about it as a valuable resource. In fact, it is and can be. The global economy today is fundamentally based on carbon-based materials. You just have to look around the room to recognize that most of the stuff around us is made of carbon-based materials. And the big idea here is that we can make some, or maybe even a huge fraction of those materials using abundant uh, extra carbon dioxide. Fertilizers, paints, fuels, building materials, carbon nanofibers, there's a, a wide range of materials we can uh, pursue. The science of converting carbon dioxide into um, any material has been well known and characterized actually for several decades. We know how to do this. Uh, the science is pretty well understood. The questions at the cutting edge now are about engineering, scale up, uh, business, finance, and policy. Yes, we can improve on the science, but there's also, this field is now maturing and transitioning into broader questions. Not can we do it, but <coughs> how do we do it? And how do we do it in a way that makes economic sense, makes business sense, um, makes broader policy sense? Carbon tech, as I've mentioned, is a great opportunity to specifically generate revenue by harvesting a low value carbon dioxide feedstock. Carbon dioxide is, it's a, there's basically no cost to emit it. Uh, there is a market price, but it's an incredibly low value feedstock. Uh, now, it's not free to convert it into other materials. It generally takes uh, energy, specifically. Uh, but whereas we typically focus on the costs of carbon emissions, carbon tech is an opportunity to also focus on the value and the opportunity that they can bring. Uh, as mentioned before, this is an early stage uh, technology area, and how do we unlock this? Innovation. This is where the Carbon X Prize enters. The NRG COSIA Carbon X Prize was designed exactly to try to catalyze this type of innovation and to drive breakthroughs in this space that can lead to um, benefits in this community, in the state, and across the nation and the world. The mission of X Prize is to try to help solve big problems that can impact and benefit all of humanity, and certainly climate change and our, the need to do carbon and transition and manage our energy systems and deal with our excess CO2 falls into that category. The prize launched in 2015 and is about to conclude next spring, the spring of 2021, where we hope to announce winners um, from some of the demonstrations we see outside today. After evaluating and demonstrating 
uh, or witnessing demonstration of dozens of technologies from around the world. We have now narrowed the competition down to 10 finalist companies, um, some of whom have the opportunity to test them at the ITC. The ITC was chosen specifically as the testing ground. In fact, uh, the XPRIZE was an early partner in helping it you know, uh, get stood up along with the leadership of Governor Mead, Governor Gordon, uh, the legislature of Wyoming, you folks here on this committee, and in, in fact, the broader Camel County and Wyoming community, without which none of this would be possible. I just cannot stress how enough how important the ITC and an opportunity to test a small industrial pilot is to the scale up of innovation. Mr. Beggar mentioned this earlier. Uh, you don't just come across facilities like this. Carbon tag, carbon recycling is not something you can build up in your garage. It's not two people on PowerPoint slide. It's an industrial technology, it requires safe operating, uh, policy support, business partnership. And this test, this type of testing facility, which sort of lives between university labs, research labs, and commercial market is a key piece of infrastructure. Uh, I really want to underscore that point. Facilities like the ITC are unique in this space and absolutely crucial. Now, I mentioned earlier that materials like concrete, gasoline, plastic, synthetic textiles can all be made out of CO2. Um, generally speaking, making products out of CO2 can take a couple of forms. We can make stuff we already are well familiar with, as I mentioned. We can make fundamentally new materials that are barely in use today, but could be in broad use in the future, for instance, carbon fiber. Or we can make better or lower carbon versions of materials we already have. So I'll give an example. You'll, uh, you'll see from a company called CO2 Concrete, they'll give us a tour a little bit later, I hope. They make concrete. Concrete is not their innovation. Their innovation is to use CO2 to make concrete and to make that concrete lighter, greener, stronger, stiffer than it otherwise might be. So it's an example of a replacement material, a better version of something we already have that just happens to be based on carbon. Um, Senator Enzi, you uh, made a remark about jet fuel and liquid fuels earlier. That's another example. Um, it is possible and people are already making jet fuel out of carbon dioxide. Is it better than existing jet? Jets fly the same, but the carbon intensity is much reduced. Now, we know that making industrial commodities out of CO2 um, is a great opportunity. It's an economic and a business and technology opportunity. But there's something else I'd like to highlight, um, and that is making consumer products. This is kind of an interesting emerging niche in this space. Um, I, I brought a handful of uh, items to show and tell, which I can do about later, but the interesting thing about consumer products is that it provides an opportunity to have a conversation with everyday people about the opportunity of what CO2 conversion can be. It's one thing to say we can make jet fuel or we can make concrete. The average person isn't really thinking about that in their daily lives, not relevant to our, sort of our regular culture. But making items like uh, this hand sanitizer in front of me, you know, how timely. This is actually made of recycled CO2. Um, and this is something I think, especially at this moment, we can all relate to. The other thing I think is really interesting about consumer products is it, um, of course, we need strong policy support, we need business support and innovation from science and engineering. But we also <coughs> need to support all of that conversation um, to permeate this conversation, this idea, this vision in the broader public. And I think that consumer goods are not going to absorb all the emissions coming out of drive workstation. They're not going to solve the problem on their own, far from it. But they are an interesting entry point into this conversation for what is a pretty abstract and new technology area, but one that I think can be quite powerful to help decarbonize our energy sector. Uh, with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you again for the opportunity to share these remarks. And I look forward to questions and discussion. Well, thank you, Bill. All uh, we'll start with a series of questions. I wanted to pick up on what something that you had said, but ask Colleen the question. Uh, because you talked about Wyoming and what resources we have. And I think, Holly, you started by saying, if you take only one thing away from this hearing, I was going to ask you to go back to that specific sentence. But it started with, Wyoming is the ideal place, if I got it right. So could you please, again, so the press, they got the cameras going yep. now, they need to hear this statement. Yep. I mean, if there's one thing you take from my testimony, let it be that Wyoming is an ideal place to drive innovation and deployment of climate-focused technologies such as carbon capture, use, and storage, or CCUS, because the state boasts vast fundamental subsurface knowledge, world-class research programs, the ability to execute large demonstration projects, and the will to drive technology development with the necessary policy support that can ultimately result in commercialization. Our marching orders from here and to us, Wyoming is the ideal place. Yes. The, uh, Jason, I wanted to start with you. The Use It Act to fund research such as that's occurring right now, getting ready to test center, 
one of the key criteria to receive funding under the Use It Act, as we call it, is having a partnership with other groups. It could be academic, university, commercial, government. How important to have a strong private partnership, public partnership been so far in developing this integrated test? Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I think the, the partnerships that we've pulled together here um, is an ideal sort of model for what the Use It Act does. Uh, earlier this year, the ITC we received an award from uh, an international group. Uh, the carbon, it was a carbon leadership award, a uh, global award for innovative partnerships. And, and the, the strength in that is really comes down to, at the end of the day, we need partners, we need customers for these technologies that are going to be developed. And so having Basin Electric and the, the, the real electric cooperatives and Tri-State and everyone on board um, they could look at something and go, actually that is something we would use and we would commercialize and we would take forward. And so, um, you know, w without somebody who's gonna take it to that next level, all you have is a really neat science experiment. And really, nothing, there's nothing wrong with those, but if we do want to commercialize, you need to be working with those end users. And so I think that was a very important part of the partnership. The other part is, I mean, you look at the power plant outside behind it, it's 1.4 billion dollar asset. Clearly, they're very good at project management, procurement. You know everything that it takes together to, to execute. And by leveraging their expertise, you know I mentioned how we were able to come in. You know this is the Wyoming thing that we're pretty proud of. Really under budget and ahead of schedule. And then that was not saying as the state of Wyoming we need to stand up our own team to do this. We like hey let's let's lean on lean on these people that do this every day. And then they executed, you know, as as promised. Uh, Dr. Eisler, just a couple of things. One is, I, I, got, I got the impression you're very optimistic about what we're doing here. So I'm going to ask you to expand a little bit on what commercial breakthrough we may really be seeing here. Uh, and can you discuss the competitive process that was used to select the finalists? I know there are five here, and there are five also in Canada. Just how that all has worked? Yeah, certainly. Um, I'll take the second part first. Uh, the way that this, uh, first thing I'll say is that um, it's important to remember the purpose of the competition is to try to accelerate uh, the pace of innovation in this space. Jason mentioned earlier that you know it's quite complex to take something from an idea through to an industrial technology that can run at scale safely and effectively for years. Um, even shaving a little bit of time off of that, uh, uh, money, as Jason alluded to earlier, is sort of a goal uh, for everyone. And the next prize is sort of a borderline and ludicrously extreme version of that. We set an extremely ambitious goal, put it out to the world and say, who can solve this problem? We're not sure who, but I bet someone can, and a cash prize might uh, help drive that. The call is open to anyone in the world, which received dozens of submissions from around the world. We have an independent panel of judges, uh, Dr. Kirk being one of them, actually. Um, and they have down-selected, by looking at performance data and evaluating the data that the team submit, down to 10 finalists, five, as you mentioned, and five at a similar facility, also uh, built around the same time, called Alberta Carbon Conversion Technology Facility, uh, Center. The key difference being it's fed by a natural gas plant, not a coal plant. Um, the teams are evaluated in three basic criteria. One, uh, their economics. Does this process look like it could become a sustainable business? Two, environmental sustainability, which really boils down to, are you using more CO2 than you produce? You can make hand sanitizer and produce CO2 in doing it. We're interested in um, and third, engineering variables. Are you more efficient than your peers or not? Which usually boils down to uh, how efficiently, how little energy can you use to execute this process. Um, my optimism, I, I would call it uh, data-driven optimism. Uh, this is a huge problem, but it's also an opportunity. I will say that there's a market opportunity and also sort of a technology opportunity. The market opportunity is that, I'll, I'll reference a, a figure here, uh, an independent not-for-profit called Carbon 180 did a market study. All right, what are all these CO2 materials? What are we talking about? How can we actually get into these markets? Just looking at known technologies today and known material markets, actually circa 2017, they estimated that the total addressable market is $1 trillion. Um, that's a small number in the context of the global economy. It's a huge number in the context of making stuff out of CO2, which is still a relatively young industry. So the market is there. I'm optimistic because of that. On the science and technology side, I'm optimistic um, by specifically the ability to produce existing materials in a cheaper and lower energy way. 
uh, lower and lower energy. Um, and that, to get into the science of it, that really has to do with sort of catalysis and how little energy you can get away with using. Um, but also in producing new materials uh, that aren't quite yet abundant in the marketplace, but could be. Uh, things like proteins uh, made of CO2, a bit of a weird concept, but that could be a feature. But also things like carbon fiber, which is a niche, expensive material used today. Projections show it could be a much broadly cheaper, broadly used cheaper material in the future. The ability to make even a small fraction of those materials using carbon dioxide emissions is a huge opportunity. And then I'll have some more questions. Oh, okay. yeah. Thank, thanks, John. Um, I really appreciate the two testimonies of all of you. And one of the things I like about it is the hearing is that we usually do have the opportunity, even after the hearing is over, to submit more questions. And I'm an accountant, so I try not to keep my readers hanging with questions <laughs> to just put the audience to sleep. Not real good questions, anyway. But uh, Jason, I'll start with you. Um, because of the pandemic, of course, there's a tremendous constraint on federal government, local government, state government, and uh, one of the things we're discovering, of course, is that uh, if the economy is not there, there's no money. <laughs> but uh, how how can we ensure that every dollar that's invested in this carbon capture and research development goes as far as possible. Yeah, uh, Senator, that's, that's a really, really good point. And, and um, one of the things that we really prioritize is these partnerships. You know, when you think about, you know, the, the Wyoming Energy Authority coming together that has members from uh, the School of Energy Resources, the Enhanced Oil Recovery Institute, the Business Council, those types of things. You know, what we really want to do is make sure that um, we're all talking and you know sharing and the worst thing we could do is duplicate what somebody else is working on so looking at ways to be as e as um, as efficient as possible and that extends to our relationships you know on the national and international level um, for example the organization called the international carbon capture test center network uh, there's 14 facilities or globally that um, that are working in this space. And uh, we, we share best practices. To, um, sometimes we share information about you know, bad actors that, are, you know, that, that are, are trying to you know, play in this space. And so um, you know, no reason to reinvent the wheel if, if people have already learned those lessons. So there, there, there's a huge uh, focus on that. Um, you know, as, a, as an accountant, uh, one of the things that uh, we've we've been able to do and work with the Department of Energy is the the funding for this facility to build you know the bricks and mortars that we have here today is 15 million dollars from the state of Wyoming, um, five million dollars from Tri-State, and one million dollars from NRECA. Well, that is all non-federal money. So if if it's accounted for and applied the right way in the same accounting language that the Department of Energy uses. It can be used as non-federal cost share on these projects. So, by tweaking our internal accounting systems, we basically found 21 million dollars to leverage against additional federal opportunities. So, we're really thinking about okay, this is what we have. Given the economic situation federally, you know, and in the state, everything else, going at back and asking for you know, $50 million probably isn't in the cards right now, so what can we do to to stretch things the best that we can? And the last area uh, along those lines is um, kind of, a, it's also kind of a Wyoming thing, is you don't need to build a Rolls Royce when a pickup truck will work. You know, you look at this facility here, it, it, it's, it's a modular facility that um, we were able to procure from you know, oil services that uh, were kind of moving on. Um, we were able to make it ADA compliant, you know, it, it meets every standard, but it wasn't a, you know, $20 million, you know, facility that had all the bells and whistles. Not to say we don't want to get there, but we, what we want to do is, is kind of bit by bit, piece by piece. You know, this company A is leaving behind their steam boiler. Hey, can we, you know, for a small fee, take it over and just build capacity that way. So we're really mindful about stretching the dollar the best, the furthest we can. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Predicate, um, do you need 
mentioned syngas at half the cost. Can you go into a little bit more detail on how that, what that is, how that works? <laughs> I'm not a chemist. Yeah, sure. So thank you for the question, Senator NZ. Um, so syngas, what we, um, we came from coal, um, let's see, we have a thermochemical process that is designed to create unique products from coal. Um, most of the carbon is locked up in the coal, but some of it um, comes out in the form of CO2. And so there's lots of options. So you could do something like what we're talking about, the X Prize and use it, or you could store it. Um, and I want to give a shout out to the head of our um, CEG, CEGR group, Mr. Scott Quillenen over there, and they're setting, they have the carbon safe project right outside dry fork so you could store it, or we have another potential use for it, which would be combine that CO2 with natural gas, and without getting too into the chemistry, what comes out of that, we have a catalyst um, that helps facilitate that reaction, and what you get out of that is carbon monoxide and hydrogen. And so it's the hydrogen that would be half the cost of conventional hydrogen production technologies today. And so the way you make them today is with steam methane reforming of natural gas. And so when you get syngas, which again, carbon monoxide, hydrogen, you can do all kinds of things. You can make plastics, um, you can make anything that's made from carbon and hydrogen molecules. Um, one of the things we could also do is further treat that gas to, have, to separate the hydrogen and then you have a, a clean fuel. And then again, you can use the CO2 or you can store it or you can um, or use it for other things. But, um, and then you would have hydrogen as a, a, a zero carbon or low carbon fuel source as well. Thank you. I'll draw a picture afterwards. <laughs> yeah, we'll be asking more about uh, uh, the amount of recoverable oil that there still is in the ground that yes. we can utilize to go after. I think there's a comment on that. The amount of oil? Yes. Um, the original drilling, as I understand it, was 20%. Right, yes. Um, so there, there's a tremendous, tremendous amount of work that can be done on this in this area. Even. You know, you mentioned the Center of Innovation for Flow Through Porous Media. They are focused on driving innovation to just squeeze more oil, understanding the fundamentals um, so that they can squeeze more oil out of conventional and unconventional reservoirs. I mean, there's also enhanced oil recovery, but, but there's, there's a number of technologies, but you're right, there's so, the vast majority of oil is left in the ground. And, um, you know, in a world where there may be less permits coming out, we really need to, and less drilling operations, we need to squeeze every last drop out of, out of our existing operations. IBA was funded without federal dollars? I believe, I mean, they, yes. The, the High Bay Research Facility was funded by the state of Wyoming and corporate sponsors. They, they do, they, I believe they are a suborty on a federal grant now, but that has nothing to do with the construction of the facility and the initial operation. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Eddie So we won't eat vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> well, the next day, Dilbert has the machine that will do that. But he warns the boss. He says, "Now the really important part of this is if you don't turn it off about three days a week, people will die." And in the next frame, you see the janitor going over to this machine. Say, "Whoops, this is unplugged." <laughs> so <laughs> I'm glad that you're coming up with some valuable resources. thing when we talk about uh, energy transition or even using CO2 materials because in some way, you know, in this place we're privileged to have, for instance, electricity. 
speed is basically on all the time. It's sort of surprising if you put the switch in the light system on. Um, what, when we talk about energy transition, we're sort of talking about replacing the back end uh, without necessarily a lot of disruption for the user. I, I guess what I was going for is going more into product. Right. If we can switch from some, some of the quality customers that's already out of date to carbon. Exactly. I mean, I think um, <coughs> there is a huge opportunity here. Uh, for some people, it will be very inspiring. Just let's say this polyester shirt was made out of recycled carbon. This one was made out of you know virgin oil and gas. Let's say that was drilled. Uh, some people just aren't going to care. They're just you know does the shirt fit? Does it have the right color? Do I like it or not? And that's totally fine. Um, there are some consumers. Studies show that uh, will respond well to oh this is a little bit more sustainable or oh this is made from material right in my home state, or, oh, I really like that it's made out of C2 materials. Um, but that's probably a minority of people. I think the thing that's really gonna catch people, and this is what a lot of people that are in the market are trying to do, is produce something better. This polyester shirt, to keep the example, will last longer, or hold its color better, or be cheaper, because it's made of a new feedstock. These materials are not really there today, but I think the promise of the opportunity is to get there. Um, so I think for the average person, it'll be, or let's say, a consumer of a commodity, cheaper, or better, or lower CO2 footprint, or all three. Well, you mentioned uh, permit. Underground storage of carbon dioxide requires permit uh, under the Federal Safe Drinking Water Act. Wyoming recently applied for primacy so that uh, we can issue the permits ourselves rather than having to go back to Washington and the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency. Wyoming's own expertise, the state uh, is expected to process permits, I believe, in a more efficient way, the regulators and the EPA could. So how important is really timing, timely permitting to the success of some of these underground storage projects? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I'll say, while timely permitting is really critical, the priority has to be to ensure that the, the storage risks are, um, and the storage projects are conducted safely securely and minimize the uh, potential risks to human health and the environment. But we believe that here in Wyoming, we can accomplish both. Uh, it's vital for project developers that, pro that permits are not unduly delayed. Regulators with the best knowledge of local geology, and here that means the Wyoming Department of Environmental Quality, should be able to process the permits efficiently while maintaining the safety and security of CO2 storage to launch a widespread CCUS industry. And time is of the essence for several reasons. Perhaps most importantly, the clock is running on the amended Section 45Q tax credits, the world's, world's first incentive of this type for CCUS. And claiming these credits requires construction to start before 2024. And we need rapid deployment of that technology to reduce the costs associated with the technology and a phenomenon that's been demonstrated in countless clean energy technologies before. Um, so, for many, many different reasons, permitting time is really critical. Jason, following up with what you just said, uh, about the 45Q tax credits and the extension and expansion and commercializing more carbon projects, uh, you know, how would the use of that help complicate the 45Q? Uh, Mr. Chairman, you know, I, in order for I guess, simple economics or for any project, you, you need to have a margin. And, you know, uh, for these early stage technologies, um, you know, that involves two things. You know, one is, is can you uh, increase the profitability or bring down the cost? And, and, you know, looking at what has happened in the renewable sector, you can say that's been a, a, a great success. You know, the, the various uh, tax credits to, you know, to increase the profitability coupled with the research that's been going on. And that needs to be, or could be, replicated here in, in the carbon tax sector where you know, you, you've got a tax credit like 45Q that um, provides a stable revenue stream to get us through these early stages, where at the same time the resources uh, made available through the Use It Act, um, you know, provide some research dollars, you know, to, to uh, try to bring down those costs and, and hopefully improve the margin and get to the point where at some point they're just no longer needed. You know, we, we, we kick them out of their nest, so to speak. Dr. the Use It Act has a competitive prize program, uh, one spurring more research into direct air capture. The uh, Bill Gates 
has said he doesn't want to get to a zero carbon footprint. He wants that machine, Mike, that you talked about, because he said he wants to remove from the atmosphere any carbon dioxide he's put in since Microsoft began in 1978. I think he's committed to commit $1 billion of his own money uh, to that. Can, can you discuss that whole concept of what, what you see coming down? Yes, yeah, certainly. Um, um, I think Bill Gates has it right. Um, Microsoft famously made a commitment to uh, remove the equivalent CO2 emissions that that company has produced. Um, they're a software company, so they're not sort of an emissions leader. On the other hand, that's uh, no other company has been that claim, period, and that's just new in the last few months. I think what he's describing um, is someone we fully agree with at XPRIZE. If you stack up all of our CO2 sources, some of them are easy, fewer to contail than others. Um, and the way this is going to go as we curtail emissions is it's going to, you know, we should start with the easy stuff and then it's going to get a little harder and a little harder, which means it will get more and more expensive. At some point, you'll cross a threshold where it's cheaper and more effective to keep those sources online and maybe just build another source that can actually sort of reduce the CO2 emissions. So um, I think what Mr. Gates is speaking about is trying to focus on innovation, specifically the, I'm going to go and get it and I'll share an analogy if you don't mind. This is uh, Klaus Lackner from Arizona State's analogy, but uh, many people have used it. It's akin to a trash cleanup problem. It's a pile of trash in a public park. Well, first thing you should do is not add more to the pile. That's reducing our existing emissions. Uh, even if you turn your emissions to zero or greatly reduce them, you still have a trash pile in the park. Someone's still going to go pick it up. We still have excess CO2 emissions that we're going to want to curtail. We're going to want to reduce what we can today. Going forward, we also may want to actually pull some back out of the air for the oceans. And he points out that the technology that could be developed places like here could then be used worldwide, India, China, other locations Absolutely. That, that don't have the same commitment that we do here in Wyoming. There's a tremendous opportunity, not just for the state of Wyoming, but the broader United States to be the leader in this technology in this technology area and be the nation that can develop it and export it. Um, we, we're confident that there will be demand for this technology. We're already seeing some demand expressed by companies like Microsoft, and there are a handful of others. At XPRIZE, we have a competition now for CO2 conversion. We're thrilled to be able to have the ITC as a partner in that. We hope to, in future, launch a prize for exactly this, direct air capture and other means of remediating the CO2, whether it's from agricultural land management, building a machine that sucks it out of the air, or any other method. Um, but uh, I think you're exactly on the right track with that. And, uh, So, Senator, right now, if you want to test a project at a certain size, so in the United States, you know, kind of the typical scale, but I've got a great slide that shows a very small scale carbon capture facility at Columbia University. It looks like a pressure cooker. And then the sort of the next scale up is a, <coughs> excuse me, a skid-based system, which you'll see here today. And then the next level is sort of a, a pilot scale and then hopefully commercial scale. But most utilities need to see something at the 10 to 20 megawatt equivalent to feel comfortable that systems integration and the scale up actually are a reality. So when you're these really small projects, they're a couple kilowatts. And so if you go to the National Carbon Capture Center in Wilsonville, Alabama, which is a DOE funded facility, about the largest project that they could host is about 1.5 megawatts. So if you're ready to take that next step to do a 10 or 20 megawatts size project, you either need to do a one-off deal with a power plant, and that has happened at times. You know, if you're a really well-known developer like you know, GE or um, you know, Mitsubishi or somebody like that, you have a lot of institutional reputation where you call Southern Company or Excel. But if you're a little developer calling the hey, can I cut a hole in your billion dollar power plant, they're gonna tell you to go away. So there is a facility in Norway called Mongstad that is a, it's, it's a natural gas facility, but it's um, it's similar to the ITC in ways. It's, 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 it's a wonderful facility, but is the, it is the only facility of that size globally 
where you can sort of plug and play those larger technologies. So we, over the years, we have had a number of DOE US-based technologies that have had to go to Norway to test simply because they didn't have infrastructure in the US. So um, we've gotten positive response from Norway, or excuse me, from the Department of Energy when they come out here and look at this site going, um, that there's someone specifically who has told me, every time I go to Norway and I'm at, you know, going out and I have to pay $18 for a cheeseburger, it just boils my blood because I know all of these tenants and all of these taxpayer dollars are paying $18 for a cheeseburger. So I can come to Wyoming and, you know, <laughs> spend $6 for a cheeseburger. So I, I think they're really excited to see, the, you know, how the XPRIZE uh, tenants work. Um, you know, uh, TDA is our first one out here to sort of see, okay, do these guys have this under control? Are they able to host some of these larger projects with the goal that at some point they go, yeah, we're sending all of our DOE stuff to Wyoming and not Norway. Uh, Dr. Kretka, um, I'm happy to see the continued partnership between the uh, Department of Energy and the University of Wyoming on the Carbon State Program. And I'm happy to see that with uh, Chairman Grasso and the Department of Energy uh, in support of that partnership. Can you talk about the importance of this kind of research in helping to scale up commercializing technology? Great. Right, so thank you, Senator Enzi, for that question. And um, I think, first of all, we are very, very proud of the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project. Um, we also have a great slide showing our all the partners in and around the state of Wyoming and beyond that are participating in that project. Of course, the most important par partner is, is the Department of Energy, um, especially for CO2 storage. Um, it, is, it is critical that we have these large DOE projects moving forward. Like I said, there's five around the country. We feel very positive about um, the, the Wyoming Carbon Safe Project um, for a lot of different reasons. And, and like I said, one of them is that we have the subsurface uh, knowledge and, and properties that are gonna likely make that successful. But one of the things that, that you should know about um, working with the Department of Energy and doing a, a true research and development project is that we're able to really study things on a deep level. And we're able to look at a lot of details that, that um, Need to be understood before we can launch CO2 storage on a large scale to give the government um, or regulators the, the confidence that they can they can allow this technology to move forward and permanent. The other thing we're trying to do with that project is um, make a glide path. So as industry picks up that technology and starts to deploy it um, more commercially and more widespread, you know we want to make that path easier, especially here in Wyoming where we're focused. So we're doing things like writing model contracts. Right, which you wouldn't do if you were just um, funding it with a single corporate partner, but we're gonna be able to support uh, entities wanting to deploy carbon storage projects in Wyoming in the future as a result of that carbon safe project. Thank you. That's very good hearing. Just as a, as a final comment, I do remember that General Electric was going to do a project in Wyoming mm -hmm. uh, several years ago, and they canceled it. And when we got a hold of them to find out why, they said with this uh, de-emphasis or actually um, criminalizing coal, who would we ever sell our technology to? Well, I'm glad that we have this team of people across the United States, across Wyoming, that are trying to decriminalize coal and show that it is essential to, uh, in a lot of different ways, in our lives. So thank you for your for that point. Ways to store carbon dioxide, uh, research being done with uh, seismic testing that's occurring just a short distance from here. Are there specific policies that you would recommend that uh, Congress focus on to advance some large scale uh, carbon storage? Yeah, um, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, thank you for all your, your past support of those, those policies. So, SCR Center for Energy Regulation and Policy Analysis believes that federal policy regarding management of long-term storage and liability of CO2 is vital. Um, in addition, in incentives remain critically important to ensure that CCUS will be widely deployed. Um, from our perspective, R&D funding and commercial deployment incentives go hand in hand to reduce the cost of deploying CCUS now and long into the future. Um, for example,
example, of course, there's the amended 45Q section, or section 45Q tax credit. It's vitally important. It's spurred interest so much since, since it was um, modified, but it should be extended, uh, especially given the delay with re-policing guidance. And again, thank you for your, your pressure to help get that guidance released. Um, fixing other CCUS-related incentives is, for example, 48A, um, would, that would unlock funds that are, are they're already authorized by Congress. Um, of course, we've already mentioned the Use It Act, which would help us advance things like direct air capture, but also get CO2 from sources to sink the, from the producer to the storage location. So um, beyond that, you know, there's there's a number of policies. I'll say clean energy technologies need more than one incentive to move forward. Fully agree with that. And, that's why we're observers of the Carbon Capture Coalition and members of the Carbon Utilization Research Council and fully endorse the, the policies that they've been pushing forward as well. So to, to, to Jason, so right here at Red Fork Station, it's an example of a cycle that's possible to use the, the, the stored uh, capture right at the bottom of the carbon dioxide. But other sites require pipelines to get from site one to two to transport the heat to where it's, where it's stored. So how important is a robust carbon dioxide pipeline network in order to really maximize uh, the value of the volume that we can capture and use and store? Uh, Mr. Chairman, it, it's, it's going to be critical. You know, uh, in, in some cases, I've heard people say it's going to be almost equal to the build out of the existing oil and gas pipeline network. You know, I, I, um, maybe the most simple way to think about it is we're going to need a new internet, a new national sort of interstate highway system for, for CO2 pipelines. Um, you know, the, it's kind of one of those chicken and egg arguments where you don't want to build it until you know you have users and, and producers on one end, but you can't really identify those until somebody's built it. But, um, you know, looking at how we're going to build them, what size they should be, where they should be located are all critically important. You know, one thing you know, we all recognize in Wyoming, and, and are somewhat baffled that other states don't recognize that is, you know, when, when you look at the land ownership issues in Wyoming, you know, you're, you're not going to throw a baseball across the, the highway without probably a NEPA analysis. So, you know, what can we do through things like our corridor initiatives to identify the right places to put these things, the right size that they should be and where they really need to be going. So it, it's, it's a critical link to all of this that probably isn't discussed here right now. Uh, Mike, if you don't have any other questions, I was just going to ask the three panelists to see if they had anything else. I saw Dr. Eisenberg and Nikki Toes and others have as well to see if there's anything that we didn't ask that they may want to share with us. And, uh, uh, thank you. <laughs> I, know, I know this. Uh, thanks very much, Madam Chairman. I'll be brief. Uh, I just love to lend my voice and support to the, the Use It Act. Um, I applaud your efforts and thank you very much for nudging the Secretary of the Treasury for that guidance uh, to be blunt. It cannot come soon enough. To give a practical example of I think how 45Q specifically um, can impact this space, we're going to have a look at some sort of early project developers outside of the ITC. Um, their projects are probably a little too small to take advantage of the tax credit. They also probably don't really have a tax liability to offset. However, what 45Q has done is entered, it's created a new class of people which we need in the sector, which is the project developers. They're not necessarily power stations, they're not the technology developers, they're the dispassionate people in the middle that say, okay, I know how to scale up projects, I can combine three technologies and make a large project, and we can do the accounting, and that project will benefit from 45Q. Um, I've got to know some of those folks over the last couple of years since 45Q's passage. Um, unlocking the guidance will unlock their ability to help scale this technology, which is probably a path to scale for these types of technology specifically. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for having me here today, and it's an honor to be on a panel with Dr. Explorer and Mr. Beggar. I um, really appreciate you bringing attention to this subject. Um, I guess I just follow up on, on my comment that you had me read <laughs> again and just say, you know, we've, we've been very focused on CCUS. It's a critically important technology for Wyoming and beyond. Um, the thing I'd add is I, I also think Wyoming has so much potential to be a leader in other energy technologies as well. So like I mentioned, uh, coal to products, you know, there's, we have centuries of reliable, secure coal that is 
one of the most affordable, if not the most affordable fuel in the world right here. And we're probably sitting on some right now. So I, I don't want to dismiss that in the research programs that are that are trying to find uses for that, as well as we, we're working on new types of power plants. I mean, the sky is the limit. And I'm just so, so excited to be here. And I, I hope that um, we all continue to see Wyoming as a, a leader in research for all different types of technologies. And thank you for your time. Uh, Mr. Chair, again, I really appreciate the, the chance to speak with you again in front of your committee. And would always like to open the doors to anyone in DC and EPW to come out here. You know, I think one of the things that um, people need to see is this power plant right behind us, because this is what a modern new power plant can look like and does look like. And at a time when you're seeing rolling blackouts in California, it's, you know, coal, there's a role for that and there's a need for that. And, and, and the, all the things that we're working on today are ways to ensure that we can still deliver that low cost, reliable power in ways that meet sort of new societal standards for, for cleaning or for, for clean energy. Um, you know, one of the things as we were building out sort of, I guess, the business development aspect of the ITC, you know, trying to attract these people in, we, we started saying, well, if you're coming in here, you should really talk to, you know, SER and Tulu Power Plant and EORI and all these things. And one thing that we realized after going through all that stuff is Wyoming is so perfectly and uniquely suited for a lot of reasons. You know, the world class facilities, the ITC, only one of its kind in the US. You know, that the expertise at the School of Energy Resources, our Department of Environmental Quality, you know, the, the, the great geology that we have, you know, I mean, that's something that a lot of places can offer that, you know, a quarter mile to the south here, we have a 10,000 foot well that looks like it's gonna be awesomely suited for long-term geologic storage. But then also scattered around is are a number of potential fields for enhanced oil recovery or, or production and those types of things. And, but lastly, probably the most important thing is, is this license to operate that we have within the state. That means we have political acceptance. You know, we, we see the, you know, the folks in the room today in the audience, you know, clearly there's support uh, from our, our elected officials to make this stuff happen, but also public support. You know, we've been doing EOR and carbon management for years in the state of Wyoming. So there, there's that broad public support. And one of the tenants that um, is hopefully be coming up here, they're from the Bay Area in California. And, and he told me, because the one thing that we really like about this is you guys always find a way to get to yes. You know, we couldn't imagine trying to permit this in California. We would get a hundred reasons why this won't work, as opposed to you, we'll sit down with you and go, okay, Here's the Clean Air Act, here's the you know, Safe Water Drinking Act, here are all the things that we need to do, but here's the glide path to get to yes. If you do these 10 things, we can do this right here. So people are thrilled that, you know, as a state government, we're not throwing up roadblocks, we're trying to help them get there. So, you know, there's a lot of great things about what's happening in Wyoming. We think we're the perfect place to do that and, and just sort of just the tip of the iceberg on what this stuff could look like. I'm just so grateful for all of you on the panel and for everyone uh, who's attended. There, there may, as you know, as have testified in the past, uh, there may be additional questions, written questions submitted. I talked to Texas with uh, Senator Carper of <coughs> Delaware, the ranking member of the committee. He's uh, sorry to not be able to join us today. He had to be in Delaware to help nominate one of his old colleagues in the Senate uh, last night, so he had to choose. And I said, no, I said Mr. Boat, you were on national TV. You could have been in Gillette with us. And he'll, he'll come another day to examine and uh, explore and visit and, and, and learn. Uh, but he's been very interested. This has been a bipartisan effort, as you know, in the Senate working together. Uh, you know, these things are coming out of the committee 21 to nothing. And we have very conservative members of the committee. We have Bernie Sanders on the committee. So there is a unified effort to, to make this work. We know we need all the energy. The globe needs all of the energy. We want to make energy costs for consumers and uh, getting back to Wyoming is the, the ideal place. So uh, with that, I want to thank the witnesses, thank everyone else uh, who's joined us, and uh, with that, the hearing is adjourned. Excuse me, just
a moment before uh, the room breaks up. Um, uh, for those of you who have been here at the ITC before, uh, welcome back. For those who have uh, welcome. I'm Jim Ford, the uh, local operations manager. Uh, we do have a great opportunity today uh, in conjunction with the hearings here at Senator Brasso and Senator Renzi. Thanks for, for honoring us, bringing the, uh, the EPW uh, field here and here. Uh, we're proud of this facility, the state of Wyoming, this community. We love to show.